Yeah, I, got, I got you back on board here. Good. I got Bill Phillips coming. Oh, he's coming? Okay. Hold on. Hold on a minute. Okay. Is he en route? Okay. Oh, he's here, though. Okay. I'm just going to get everybody around the top deck. You found it. Christine, who, who owns that? You found it? You found it. Okay. Come on in, folks, and uh, we'll get started on our afternoon session. Bill. You good, Dick? Okay. Hey, folks, thanks for uh, coming back. We always uh, gauge our success here by how many folks come back after lunch. And uh, you're the diehards. I'm sure if I asked for a show of hands, it would be all AUSA members. So uh, thanks, thanks for coming back. Uh, we've got two, uh, two great sessions this afternoon um, that I think you're really going to enjoy that kind of follow on uh, as uh, General Dickinson laid out in his opening remarks, uh, follows on from the great presentations we had this morning. But I did want to... Uh, uh, make a personal note here. I worked with Tim Sheriff in the 263rd when I was uh, in a number of NORTHCOM uh, assignments and uh, Colonel Tom Moore here running the JDOC over at Bowling uh, doing the NCRI ads mission. Uh, I, I think this community understands how integral the Guard is to uh, what we do in the integrated air and missile defense uh, arena. Uh, all the trigger pullers in Colorado and up in Alaska are all guardsmen, uh, turnkey, Title 32, Title 10 guys and gals. And I just want to put a plug in for uh, the guard contribution to this mission. It truly is uh, a, a homeland defense uh, mission, and that's where our guardsmen uh, excel. So uh, thank you to that group. So this afternoon we're going to kick off with a, a session uh, – which is near and dear to all the operators in the room, provide trained and ready Army missile and defense forces, uh, which should be a good discussion. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got Colonel Tom Moore as our panel chair, Ohio National Guard, the current commander of the NCR, NCR IADS mission. And I'm going to turn it over to my good friend, Lieutenant General Retired Dick Formica, who will introduce the team and act as our moderator. So, Dick, over to you. Guy, thanks. Yep. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you to AUSA for this event and for all that you do for the, our Army soldiers and families all the time. Jim Dickinson, thanks to you and to Colonel Chad Skaggs and all of the SMDC team um, helping to put together uh, what's a, a great morning. I do want to make one quick uh, shout out. He doesn't know I'm going to do it to Fran Man. Uh, he ran a great panel, but really, more than anything, uh, for the first time in history, Joe D'Atona was the most short-winded of all of the panel members. And I'm not sure how Fran pulled that off, but... Hold on. Uh, just, just wanted to say that. So it's been a great morning, and we've talked about AMD capabilities and AMD capacity, uh, all of which is uh, particularly important as we look to the future uh, and to uh, meet consistent with the theme of ensuring readiness today and building greater capabilities for the future. This panel has been uniquely organized to talk about how you take those capabilities and that capacity and provide it to combatant commanders in the form of trained and ready forces. Um, we've got 
the operational force and the institutional force. We've got both components active in Army National Guard. You're going to get the senior enlisted voice and a senior warrant officer voice. And we've got two uh, industry reps who bring great soldier experience in this field as well. So with that, let me introduce our panel. We're going to do this a little bit uh, like the second panel. They'll each have short opening remarks. I've got my headlock ready for those that miss the cue of short. Uh, but, and then we're going to be, we'll have about half the time of them giving their perspective because they bring this unique perspective and then about half the time uh, for, your, uh, for your important questions. So our panel today uh, already been introduced by uh, Guy Swan, but Colonel Tom Moore, who's the commander of Task Force Guthrie Grays, Ohio Army National Guard, duty here in the National Capital Region doing the Homeland Defense Mission, and he's our panel chair. He'll be followed by uh, first Sergeant Major Dodson, the Command Sergeant Major of the Army Air Defense Center and School, then C <laughs> excuse me, CW5 Gregory Young, TRADOC Capability Manager for AAMDC, Colonel, uh, excuse me, Colonel Mark Holler, who's currently assigned as the Executive Officer to the Army Inspector General, but is here today as a former commander of the 35th ADA Brigade in Korea. Then he'll be followed by Colonel Retired Bill Lamb, who's the IAMD Operating Unit Director at Northrop Grumman. And then we'll finish up with Lieutenant General Retired Bill Phillips, who's the Vice President for Army uh, Special Forces and Latin America Programs at the Boeing Company. So with that, I'll turn it over to our panel chair for opening remarks. Sure, thanks, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to everyone again for uh, sticking around. Uh, I, I, too, would like to thank AUSA for uh, sponsoring the gathering here. The event center's pretty darn nice. Uh, i got to get out a little bit more often, I think, see what's <laughs> going on. Uh, thank you also to Lieutenant General for Mike for moderating the panel. Sir, you've done an ex excellent job of loading a wagon, even though the uh, mule appeared to be blind from time to time. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for each of the uh, panel members, uh, who's who have experience across the spectrum, both compos, representation from all ranks and private sector partners, a wealth of experience that should generate a pretty robust hour of discussion. As said before, I'm Colonel Tom Moore. I'm the current JDOC Air Defense Operations Center Task Force Commander here in Washington, D.C. to support Homeland Defense as part of Operation Noble Eagle, a mission the National Guard's been doing for well over a decade, which continues in an exemplary manner due in most part to the effective resourcing and a predictable training program. Upon completion of this mission, I'll return to Ohio to execute a six-month training pr plan for mobilization of the 174th ADA Brigade Mission Command Element to Germany as part of the European Deterrence Initiative. So it's the reason why I'm wearing my uh, OCPs today. My ASUs, I've already shipped them back, back home uh, for uh, a pending demobilization here in the next few days. Always better to have enough more, uh, to have more work than not enough. It's a great day to be an air defender. This renaissance of air defense brings me to the pinnacle of pride in the branch and the soldiers performing the duty. The amount of work being shouldered does, however, raise some concerns. Providing ready soldiers continues to be more complex as we ask our soldiers to conduct multiple varied missions across every combatant command. Broad mission requirements exacerbated by the persistent conflict around the globe. This constant conflict has provided a proving grounds for an almost perpetual revolution in military affairs. Inherent uncertainty drives a requirement for innovative, adaptive soldiers ready to tackle any mission because our adversaries are continuing to work to overwhelm us with dilemmas. The panel discussion today is provide trained and ready Army Missile and Defense Forces. This includes both COMPOs, all Army systems, GMD, THAAD, Patriot, Avenger, as well, I think we've got to consider the implications of integ integrating air defense across joint operations and in conjunction with coalition partners and host nations. Considerations given to how forces fight from basic training, AIT, unit training, exercises, and other training to see if improvements can be made to offset our gaps. There are many great things on the horizon that we've talked about today that, that will ensure training ready soldiers in the future, but in the interim, I believe we need to focus on three elements. First, overcoming the constraints of our current first structure. Second, innovative just-in-time training programs that maximize adaptability to mission requirements and a mastery of our skills to enhance interoperability. 
While the most significant barrier to providing trained and ready soldiers is a simple fact that we don't have them in a force, the divestiture of the divisional shore adage created a significant shortfall. The reduction from 26 battalions to the current nine demands an optimal al allocation of scarce resources to meet demand signal for AMD forces. Consideration of broader multi-compo units and joint manning documents may provide some additional flexibility and faster force development in the future to grow back some of our formations. However, while growth of air defense units is underway, we must seek out opportunities to provide some slack in our requirements to facilitate development of training programs that increase readiness. The implement implementation of mission command has developed leaders that are capable of operating in a decentralized mode. It's a basic tenet of maneuver support for air defenders to operate in a decentralized environment. However, external directed training requirements detract from refining these skills. The current rewrite of AR-350-1 and the rapid action revision of the same stands to create some organizational slack to allow company level leaders some freedom to rework their training programs with a focus on enha enhancing the lethality of the force. Senior commanders must shepherd this time by creating a greater tolerance for risk to avoid critical time being laden with additional taskings. The output will be innovative leaders with a sense of urgency to deliver trained and ready forces both today and tomorrow. The response time to training deficiencies requires just in tra time training, especially for units on short deployment timelines working to cover capability gaps. <clears throat> as an example, as previously mentioned, the difficulty for National Guard 88 Brigades to develop a high degree of training with Patriot systems is being overcome by the 263rd AMDC's training effort to provide trained and ready Army Missile and Defense Forces in the Patriot Arena by conducting its Patriot training program. This is a great example of innovative leadership developing trained and ready soldiers in response to a short flash to bang mission. Brigadier General Sheriff, thank you for your leadership in setting this benchmark for training. Effective training is a human endeavor. Simply being a great digital index operator, like the famous George Jetson, will not ensure our success. Technology will not solve all of our problems. The human in the loop is critical to fully maximizing the capabilities of our system. Interoperability is key. Understanding and improving upon the plug and play capability of air defense components enhances lethality by maintaining an integrated air and missile defense picture. Training to develop field craft in a joint and coalition environment will strengthen relationships and increase <coughs> readiness. Training plans need to be designed in a way that fully capture every capability from the digital realm and incorporate injects that drive the development of adaptable air defenders. Air defense engagement operations require early detection and dissemination of threats. By bringing in multiple data sources across the theater, we increase track fidelity. Additional analog solutions, solution development must be part of our training to offset potential degraded digital systems. So I'm not saying that we immediately go to a miscus, but it, I think it is time for uh, brigades and divisions to begin looking at uh, how they pass uh, a directed early warning across theater in the event that the, the digital systems do become degraded. And it continues to be ever increasingly important that we maximize system capacity to offset the potential overmatch situ situations. It's my opinion that while we grow additional air defense capabilities, it's imperative that we protect leaders' time to enable innovative training plans that maximize current weapon systems effectiveness and capacity. These are enduring measures that will support our success today and develop leaders for tomorrow. I'll turn it over to Sergeant Major. Good afternoon. Sir, thank, thank you for that introduction. And to AUSA, thank you for the invitation to be a member of this panel. You know, as I was doing my research for this panel about trained, ready forces, and I think about my military career when I first came in the Army 30 years ago, about what we had then in inventory and what we are now for as a structure of air defenders. You think about air defenders back then, we call us duck hunters. I think we evolved to a more, more credible source than this acronym as a duck hunter. Because now the soldier we need has to be more agile and adaptive, and one has to be cognizant, has to be a cognizant domination of anything they have for the system. One is how do they really employ the system? Can they fight it? Not just operate on a computer. Can they operate it? So that's where right now in the Air Defense School, from half of General McIntyre, who is currently in Huntsville, he's doing a CFT mission. Uh, he has released, has assigned to release the uh, 2018 ADA strategy. You get that, you can see how we're looking at for us developing the force. On that, we use really three lines of effort. 
self-development, institutional, and the operational. That's how we're going to, each one of those complement each other. So it's not just a schoolhouse responsibility, it's not just operation, not just a self-development. It's all those components tied together to make sure we have our air defender who is relevant and adaptive in our job for the air defense. And I say air defense, I don't just mean just air defense, also in the space arena. With a and 2s we have 14 echoes, 14 guards, 14 hotels. That's also caused us to have functional courses, which are not part of the POI correctly from the trade-off. So those are kind of out of high to make sure we have the right warfighter in the air interior to make sure we have the AMD portfolio in enterprise correct. Um, as you look on this, I'm not going to hit everything based on redundancy and what's been hit already. Um, the ADA NCO 2025 strategy, this is the first time we've ever done a strategy only for NCOs. This is nested with the ADA strategy and the NCO 20, 2025 strategy. This makes sure not only, not say we're special or different, but to make sure the air defense NCO has a timeline and a structure that know what to be, what we need to do, and what timeline to be the best NCO to help support the commander and the unit for effectiveness and to make sure we can win the win on the war, put it out, not without the means. The next thing here is the cross-functional team. I also have the, the privilege of serving at the CFT SAW major, and I get to see also what they're working on as well with, as in turn to the ADA and to the branch. So I get to leverage and kind of mail a lot of those things, and I'll talk a little more of that later about for us, the ALC and the, and the SLC, what kind of the GLOs we need to have into those POIs. Then you're looking at the uh, credentialing. Right now we have, we started training, the uh, forklift training for those 14 tangos. This also helps the soldiers once they get out of the military and also when they stay in, those, lunch, those crew members, 14 tangos, they actually have a skill set that help them when they get to a unit how to operate a forklift correctly. We also started now is our instructor credentialing program which they have a bachelor degree where they do all the courses from OSU. And also we have um, more, um, credentials we're working on, those also been added to WebCool. With this, I would ask everybody to go on to ACT, CML 14, become a member. It's not just for enlisted, it's for officers and warrant officers. And we're pushing a lot of things out on that uh, to get to the warfighter so they have a ready reach back capability. A digital rucksack, that was just approved by the Army, was released. Those you have Android, good luck for you. It's already readily available for you. So I mean, before I know it kind of hurts you for Apple users. It's not designed, it hasn't up caught up on the, the uh, technology for that yet, but they are working on that. But you can go on, it's a readily reach back capability for all those resources across the uh, domain here. And then this goes into the, the biggest issue I want to kind of highlight now is our personnel. Personnel is one of our biggest challenges in the branch. We are working every level we can, and thanks to General Dickinson, he's been helping us out on getting our personnel uh, identified in Colonel, Bra in Colonel Brady to work from bonuses to we looking at we did line score reductions of 14 echoes looking at the rest of 14 Gotham Hotel which is the only two we have that's tied to a GT score. We're also looking at our uh, recruiting command reducing that 74 personnel. So we're looking at all those things we got to have to get personnel into the force so we have that force structure we can provide to the 5488 you see on the slide there the growth. Um, then the training, third brigade, we have the traps been approved for trap 1803. That's 4,000 4, personnel across the five inventory that's coming to the schoolhouse. So we'll maximize the dot mil PF to look at this training, the schoolhouse, the, uh, the classrooms, barracks, and the instructor-student ratio. That goes until we have a competing demand with the operational force. How many per green students can we have on platform versus the operational force? The 14, I mean, the uh, staff sergeant population is our biggest deficit. Right now, we have 164 staff sergeants that we, are, that, we are, that, we are, that we have a shortage of. That staff sergeant population also competes for our, I'll say, recruiters, drill sergeant, platoon sergeant, and no other special duty signs we got to have. And we did 15 off the SMDC uh, MTO to give them to the air defense to get more staff sergeants, E5, into the, this uh, SMDC growth pattern. But the problem is, as training, with those 164 we are missing, so that means the E5 is holding the opportunity on position. So we're working through those in ALC and the SLC. When they come back, what do we need to train them on? How do we make sure we assess them? We're doing now, we also have pre-tests we give them to see where they are before they start the course. So the cadre will know exactly where they need to go to. And that also goes to our, our warrant officers, kind of go that route. We don't have enough staff sum for warrant officers. So right now we have instituted where officers can now go be a warrant, a warrant officer. I'm also working on, working on um, off the street, 
high school students to come be a warrant officer for tacticians. Yeah, yeah. So we're looking at everything that's on the table. There's nothing that we won't touch to make sure we can get the right talent, the right skill set, so we make sure the branch is that much more relevant. Uh, I know I'm, I'm hearing General Mike give me the, the, the hope, the, give me the nudge right now, but and the last thing I want to hit on, and more importantly, is PMG, AMG, and Top Gun, and ADAPT codes. Those functional courses, we are revamping all those. Captain Career course, our outcome based, the warrant officers, we split it out to 140 Echo to 1 Kilo and 140 Lima. Um, in, the NCO and uh, Master Gunner course, PMG based on guys from AMDCs and their AR comments. We have, we, we are revamping the course to what we need for the operation and for what we need out there in the future to come. The AMG course, Avenger Master Gunner, we're gonna, re, we're gonna re, um, redo the POI to make sure it includes if pit, and at the end, we're gonna change the, from PMG and AMG to AMD Master Gunner. And if I heard the last buzz, and I'm getting this, getting, I'm getting the heat ready right now, is that <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> I didn't say nothing. The Master Gunner, out of all the uh, courses in the Army, we were one of the six uh, MOS's branches that got approved to have our Master Gunner course based on our rigor. So the Patriot Master Gunner and the Avenger Master Gunner badge is approved for us once the mill pro master is put out, once the CSA approves the design. It's 120 days to get design completed for an apartment of Hildry. But with that being said, sir, I, I got the heat run. I'm going to take my push-up later, but I'm going to turn it over to I learned a long time ago when the Sergeant Major's got your attention, <laughs> let him have it. So good for you, Sergeant Major. Well done. No, thanks. Uh, I, now we'll in, turn it over to Chief Warrant Officer 5, Greg Young. Sorry, Sergeant Major. I think I'm going to have some rollover minutes for you. So... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I would like to first. Sir, I'd first like to uh, thank you and USA for the opportunity to participate in today's event. Uh, as one of the newest CW5s in the branch, I'm truly honored for this privilege. Thank you. Uh, I would like to give a quick synopsis of what the mission, roles, and responsibilities of the TRADOC Capability Manager Air, Army Air and Missile Defense Command are. The mission of the TICM AMDC is to perform as the central, Army's centralized functional system integrator and lifecycle manager for all capability developments and user activities associated with the air and missile defense capability area to include organizations and associated systems. Our responsibilities are to perform as a TRADOC centralized manager of all facets of user activities responsible for fielded and developmental ADA systems. We integrate, synchronize, and coordinate <coughs> efforts across dot mil PF domains coordinate with Army joint and international partners agencies to integrate and support operational requirements and to perform as the counterpart and user advocate to the PEO, Missiles in Space, MDA, SMDC, and their associated AMD project program managers. My specific responsibilities as the Senior Patriot Logistics Officer include, but are not limited to, is the Patriot Recapitalization Program, Modernization, and New Equipment Training. These three specific activities impact operational readiness and are in direct support of providing trained and ready forces. Patriot Recapitalization Program was approved in August 2001 by the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army and subsequently revalidated by the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army in 2004. The Recapitalization Program is designed to overhaul all end items of the Patriot system to a near new condition, zero miles, zero hours, and insert new technologies, modernization, if you will, to address component obsolescence. Patriot Recap is performed primarily through the military industry partnership of uh, the dedicated professionals of the uh, Letterkenny Army Depot, Raytheon Corporation in Andover, Massachusetts, and the Lockheed Martin Corporation in Lufkin, Texas. The first Recap Battalion was fielded in fiscal year 2003. Recap is funded for one battalion per year, and we have just completed the first unit of the second iteration of the Recap program and are well underway with the second. Modernization. Currently, there are several moder Patriot, moder Patriot major upgrades in progress. As, as we heard previously with, from the PEO uh, and some of the, some of the big Army folks uh, talking about modernization, talking about development. Uh, another thing that happens with, within the Tickham AMDC is, is when, when shortcomings are, are identified in the field, we, we, we close that gap. We make that capability gap. We turn it over to the to the uh, PM and, and the industry to come up with a material solution. Once the material solution is, is identified, funded, approved, tested, and ready to be fielded, it comes back down through us as a coordinated agency between those external agencies and, and the green suitors. 
Uh, currently, we've got Modern Man Station, Combined Cryptographic Modernization Phase 1 or CCMP1, and Configuration 3 or C3 Plus, uh, which includes such, such upgrades as Peripheral Enhancement 1, Radar Digital Processor, and of course, everything that ties it together here is the software, the post-deployment build uh, 8.0 software. Although Modern Man Station and CCMP1 are standalone MWOs, they are often bundled with C3 Plus. All these MWOs address obsolescence and capability concerns. Additionally, the logistical footprint required to repair and maintain the weapon system is significantly reduced, therefore improving operational readiness. We are currently executing modernization at the rate of four battalions per year with an estimated completion date of fiscal year 22. Battalions going through recap will have the equipment modified at the depot and issued at their home station. And as Colonel Holler will soon attest to, these MWOs are also being applied in the field, uh, as, as we most recently did with 35th Brigade uh, on Peninsula. Uh, the 4th Battalion is, is near completion with two scheduled for completion this summer and one this fall. Uh, Colonel Shanks Battalion over there in, in uh, 10th Double AMDC Area 578A. In addition to these ongoing MWOs, there are many ECPs or engineering change proposals that are being uh, developed to address gaps and improve other areas of the system. With recap and modernization uh, and, and, and any other upgrade that comes along, surely there is a, there is a, a, a gap that needs to be addressed, uh, the, the delta between the uh, legacy equipment and the, and the upgrade, and that is delivered via new equipment training. Uh, so with this net, it is delivered by a team of subject matter experts that are well-versed with both legacy equipment and the equipment upgrade. And I, as I said, the focus of the POI to, is to train the delta between the legacy equipment and applied upgrade. Net training is essential and required for the user to gain proficiency with their new equipment. Uh, with that, uh, uh, unfortunately, not every recap or MWO is in the fueling process is a, is a success story. That is the uh, case of 35th AD modernization on Penn. Uh, that is not to say that all others have failed, but to say that at times we do encounter significant cha challenges in the field. And to that point, I will, I will, I will end my comments and, and uh, uh, await any Q&A that, that may come. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Colonel Holler. All right, well, it's a, it's a pleasure for me to, to speak here today at this symposium. I look out in the audience and a, a lot of uh, folks I, I really admire and respect. Uh, so uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, recently finished Brigade Command in Korea, uh, where I saw firsthand a lot of the um, positive momentum and increasing uh, readiness and lethality for our Army Air and Missile Defense System. So I, uh, that, uh, that's my perspective, and I'll, I'm really just going to tell a little bit of the story of what we accomplished uh, in Korea uh, while I was there. So we, um, you know, and the perspective, too, comes from uh, – truly having to build and, and maintain a fight tonight readiness capability in the face of an ever-increasing uh, Korean threat. You know, we, we witnessed it there, uh, uh, nearly uh, weekly uh, events as, as you were reading about and watching on television. So uh, it, was, uh, it was real and, and up front for us and um, uh, a great opportunity. Like uh, Tom said, no, no better time to be an air defender. Uh, so my remarks will really uh, focus in two areas, uh, the, the ongoing important readiness effort of uh, Patriot modernization the Chief kind of highlighted, as well as some current capability gaps that were uh, evident while I was there. So first, uh, Patriot modernization. Uh, the, the 35th ADA Brigade was the first operational Patriot uh, unit to undergo uh, this depot level modernization effort that really was the most significant uh, upgrade to the weapon system since the 1990s uh, in the advent of the PAC-3 uh, interceptor. Uh, so it's uh, post-deployment build 8 or PDB-8 uh, config 3 plus that Chief just described to you. Uh, replaced uh, many of the original uh, analog uh, components with new uh, digital components. So what we saw right away after the modernization uh, was a measured increase uh, in the reliability of the systems in a lot shorter maintenance cycles. So we already started seeing um, um, you know, profits or uh, uh, positive outcomes of the, of the modernization. So we also, of course, uh, with that um, upgrade, we have uh, the ability to detect uh, targets at a much further range and then to engage in it, and it just basically increased overall lethality. And I guess most important uh, aspect of this upgrade uh, was that it, it – um, 
it maximize the capability of our, of our new interceptor, uh, the, the MSC uh, missile. So one of the uh, unique things about what we did in Korea with this upgrade is we actually uh, can completed this depth level upgrade in a forward stationed environment. And we, and we did it uh, while we maintained our uh, complete mission requirements to protect our assigned defended assets uh, that were, were given to us by General Brooks, the CFC commander over there. Um, so we didn't do it alone. It was an Army-wide effort uh, to include many of the folks in this room, uh, uh, folks back at the schoolhouse industry. Uh, we, we brought the equipment forward uh, from the schoolhouse. Uh, we brought equipment forward from Forcecom was involved uh, out of 11th AEA Brigade. And then uh, USERPAC and, and 94th WMDC, 1180A out of Japan, they, they actually uh, deployed uh, fire units forward, equipment and personnel to, to fill the gap as we brought our soldiers and equipment offline to go through the, through the upgrade. So that was a, a pretty significant event. And, and as we talk about training for uh, air and missile de defense forces and what's uh, really important to us is we use that modernization effort uh, to practice the war plan because uh, uh, like all the combatant command war plans, it requires uh, additional uh, AMD forces to come into theater. Uh, so we put a lot of emphasis uh, on the pre-deployment uh, preparation certifications of the forces and the equipment that were coming over. Uh, the movement using uh, Air Force and, and Navy assets, uh, uh, land and uh, air, and then really um, uh, a tremendous 8th uh, Army-wide effort for the reception, uh, staging, onward movement, and integration of those systems. So it was, it was a great event, and we were truly uh, a supported command uh, main effort uh, there in Korea. And I think that's true with all uh, AMD forces. If we really think about this, I like the... Uh, what I heard earlier is, you know, we're not going to win the war, but we can lose it. And uh, we're a vital uh, capability in phase zero and phase one of every O plan, and that's uh, very important. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that 7th Air Force was, was critical in the, in the support of that modernization effort uh, as they provided facilities. And um, so we couldn't have do it, done it without them. It was a joint endeavor, uh, just like uh, most AMD operations. Just real quick on uh, capability gaps. So uh, with that upgrade, you know, that was a thing we really needed for the Patriot Force, but uh, there, there still exists um, an interoperability between the, the lower tier and the upper tier. I know that uh, the, the cross-functional team and uh, MDA are working real hard on a, on a near-term uh, solution for that, but that, that's something that's significant uh, that we need to do. And, and the first step is the interoperability between our Army systems uh, and then we can look to interoperability, uh, you know, with our joint and uh, coalition and, and allied partners. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I, I know we've got, uh, there was a lot of talk about interoperability and the way ahead for that. And uh, I'll, I'll save uh, anything else for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Colonel Lamb. So, General Fomica, thanks uh, for the earlier introduction. And thanks to AUSA for the opportunity to pitch as a part of this panel. Uh, I'm bringing, trying to bring an industry perspective to the training component of uh, how do we train and equip uh, our IMD force. Uh, today, uh, IBCS is undergoing incremental testing approach focused on evaluating performance and capacity to meet operational requirements. The data and findings from that testing will build a body of lessons learned, acquired, and documented from soldier training and systems operations over the course of the EMD program. I want to take a look, brief amount of time just to try to highlight some of the challenges that we anticipate seeing as IBCS completes testing and gets fielded to the, uh, to the active force. First challenge is the system of systems training evolution that IBCS will drive. For decades, our approach to training air defense soldiers has been platform and weapon system centric. Vulcan, Chaparral, Hawk in the 70s, 80s, I came through that. I know looking in the audience, several of you came through that same level of testing. And today, it's very focused on CRAM, uh, Patriot, short-range air defense, BAD, et cetera. There's a, a weapon system focus. And this is a framework that has dominated uh, our approach to training uh, in the air defense branch for, for really decades. And when IBCS fields, and then it's really going to drive a, a new paradigm in terms of, of how testing and training will need to be conducted. As IBCS com completes development as field of the Army, the paradigm is really going to change. Uh, just as the IMD force transitions from a system-centric operational mindset to a larger system-to-systems operational employment context. 
One of the training challenges we've encountered on IBCS development and operational testing is that the soldiers have an ingrained uh, view based on the system that they've been developed on. So if I, if I come at this from a Patriot perspective, well, then I've got a perspective around Patriot capabilities and what I can do with a, a Patriot weapon system. With IBCS, that's going to be much more expanded. So, so one of the training challenges uh, that, that we will need to address going forward is the fact that we need to train soldiers to be able to grasp the larger battle space and, and enhance set of battle management tools and capabilities that IBCS is going to afford. IBCS will require soldiers to think beyond the capabilities and limitations of the individual systems that they have to employ to a broader operational context that will encompass the planning and engagement of a full spectrum of threats, a larger and more complex battle space, and the best employment of effects and sensors to defeat a threat. This will require that we train soldiers to evolve beyond focusing on individual weapon system, on an individual weapon system, toward being IMD tacticians and experts on the employment of multiple types of effectors and sensors as a part of a larger IMD enterprise. So second major challenge, and it's one that, uh, that I saw in the THAAD program when I managed it, and that is the, the development of training and simulators to be able to accompany the system as it's deployed to the institutional training base and as it supports new equipment training. Uh, and that's a significant challenge. And over the years, TAD's development, much like the systems they were derived from, have been developed solely to support the training of a specific system. So while hardware and software capabilities have evolved to create opportunities to have trainers be more reconfigurable and adaptable, they are still focused on the individual weapon system they were designed to support. So as we plan for IBCS future fielding, TADS will need to be developed to incorporate the pres presentation of a full AMD threat. We need to replicate the capabilities and limitations of all the IMD effectors and sensors that it employs, as well as the capabilities from joint and multi-domain assets. So this will be a significant challenge given historical program and acquisition management construct that is built around development and delivery of individual systems by systems of systems. And so with that, I'll stop and look forward to your questions. Thanks, Bill. And General Phillips. Dick, thanks. And first of all, I want to thank AUSA General Swan. Uh, please uh, pass on our best to General Ham. also. General Dickinson, thanks for being here and always an honor to be in your presence. Uh, Dick, thanks a lot for your leadership as well. I've known you since 1776 almost. <laughs> and uh, you always bring great value to the Army no matter what job uh, you may be doing. Uh, so thank you. And Colonel Moore, Colonel Holler, Sergeant Major, Thanks to you for what you and your soldiers are doing every day uh, to make sure our nation uh, stays ready uh, and uh, ready to fight and defeat wherever they may be in the world. Uh, again, an honor for me to be here. I'm going to take a little different approach, uh, and that's going to be based upon my time as a military deputy somewhat and also having spent almost four years on the industry side now. Uh, and I'm going to take the approach really of uh, .mil PF. When I looked at this, and Dick and I were talking the other day about this panel, uh, for me, it really falls into that category. And so my experience going back as a young soldier, field artillery initially, we were going to fight and win, defend the Fulda Gap, fight and win on the plains of Europe. And we had doctrine in place, we had organizations in place, we had force structure, we had a lot of things in our favor. And I think that's what the air and missile defense community really faces today as a prime challenge. By the way, I was in the green room just a second ago and saw General Mattis, a comment that he made, the U.S. military, quote, coming back, unquote. And I think about this forum and what this forum means. It's really a defining the way the air and missile defense as a community will come back, and it's absolutely essential that we do just that. But going back to Dot Mill PF and what, what that has meant for me, uh, how many in here know Dr. Carver, Dr. Phil Carver, or have been in presentations with him, listened to him and his ideas and his 30-plus visits, uh, my understanding, uh, to Ukraine to watch how the Russians are fighting today? Spent a lot of time talking to him just individually and also listening to him in an audience. He has a power, powerful message. And Rear Admiral Macy sat here and made a, a comment also, the threat gets a vote. As we think about what we want our formations to do and the force structure and the young men and women coming inside our army. We got to think about the doctrine initially because everything sort of flows from that. Uh, second, the organization structure. And I'm go not going too deep into this, but doctrine, tactic, 
tactic, tactics, techniques, and procedures are critically important for soldiers and leaders. Organization, you know, we have to protect our combat formations. There is a gap today, as we all know, in, in air and missile defense that we have to go after and solve. This also forms a key basis for bringing in young men and women, bringing them inside an organization that has the right level of doctrine, tactics, techniques, and procedures, and they are ready to be trained and to fight uh, any kind of combat that we put them in full spectrum. Father Oye, I wanted to say something to the Sergeant Major as well. Being an aviator for much of my career, with great love and pride, I use the term duck hunters. Uh, and with my friend, friend, friend Mahan, often inside the Pentagon. Training. Training is critically, critically important. One challenge with training that we have to overcome, and many of you know this, it's inside the building. If I were to ask, you know, what, who said well, nothing happens without money, anybody that's been in the Pentagon would know that nothing is going to happen unless you garner the resources to be able to make this happen. And it's money and it's people to be able to put those two together. Uh, that will drive training, realistic and effective training. We have to make sure that the funding is aligned with that in a most positive way. It drives readiness, uh, and it, it's just something that we have to do. Materiel, uh, during my time as a PM, PEO, and four and a half years I spent as VA SALT, I thought often that we looked at Materiel too quickly. I don't think we, we, we are doing that today. And I think the CFTs under Randy McIntyre and his team have such a challenge because of where the material sits inside the A&D formations today. It's absolutely critical. One thing that the Boeing company did is done recently. Uh, we teamed with General Dynamics about a, a year and a half ago to build the Mshore Ed solution. Uh, and the guy who built that is Ron Eccles, who's in the room back there about halfway back. And in about two weeks, talking to Bob Lennox on the GD side and some others, we put GD and Boeing engineers together, and in a couple of weeks, we had the solution that it, those of you that might have followed what happened out of White Sands, the exact same vehicle that went out there and actually shot three for three. Uh, so I think that brings up to one point that I want to make, speed and innovation. When you think the Army and Army acquisition, you don't think about speed and you don't think about innovation very often. But if you peel the onion back on what we have done over 16-plus years of combat, we have done some remarkable things from MRAP, MATV, double B hull in 15 months from a PowerPoint chart to having aircraft land in Kandahar with double B hulls rolling off to save soldiers' lives. We know how to do this. We should not hide behind regulations, the federal acquisition regulation, the bureaucracy, our rules or regs. We have to stay within the law, but we shouldn't hide behind that. We know how to do this, and we must be transparent and we must do it in a partnership kind of way. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, the panel did a great job staying disciplined. We left you about 17 minutes for questions, and I've got two so far. So please uh, come up with your questions and send them in to, to Alex. Um, first, uh, first question is pretty discreet, and I'm going to uh, give it to Colonel Moore. Uh, the second question that I have, I'm actually going to let the panel talk to it because it's a, a bit broader. Uh, but first, for Colonel Moore, is there still a mix of weapons in the NCRI IADS mission? And if so, is there an intent to pure fleet it in the NCR? So this is a, this is a, this is a great question, uh, and something I get to talk about a lot when, <coughs> when I bring people in for the uh, for the briefings at the, the operations briefs. Uh, the the intent is not to to go to a single system. Uh, this is the only place that I've ever seen uh, an air defense architecture where. I'm uh, exceeding the requirements of the, of the uh, principles or the guidelines of air defense, and I'm able to employ uh, uh, all the principles as well, mass, mix, mobility, and integration. So the mix is, uh, is, is very important to me, and, and quite honestly, if I, if I could, I'd make it a little bit more robust, but uh, yeah, that's contingent upon the requirements for, uh, for emerging threats, et cetera. Uh, this next question actually speaks to the strength of the panel because we can get the generating force perspective, operating force perspective, um, b perspective of both compos, and again, I'd welcome uh, insights from our industry reps. The question is, how are you training Army AMD for peer threats? We've heard a lot about uh, the peer threats uh, this morning. Uh, what are the implications of that for training Army AMD uh, particularly against uh, their 
weapons, UAS, and EW cyber. So I'll, I'll let the panel speak up. Sir, for the schoolhouse right now, based on our assessment of an AR comments, working with DOT-D, uh, we're working towards uh, those, like I said, the Adapco course, but those working with the ATSI, the RATC, and so forth in the AMDCs, we make sure those persons know how to lay the system. But you look at like in, in, in Germany right now, we're training the man pads out there with the uh, 2CR and 173rd. And right now we're training 130 personnel in manure force to help, to help supplement the AMD um, shortage we have in the Shoreat force. And right now we're training the A2nd Airborne to, for that, that system to help out with the threat of UASs over there in Germany. Before as in the, 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 the current Patriot bad, we are working those functional courses to redesign those. So we did a, a functional review for all our courses per trade our guidelines in December. So what do we really need in institutional force generally we need to have for the threat that's coming up coming up right now? Uh, and I go to, you know, with Dot D, like Sir like General said earlier about with Dot D, we are uh, redesigning our POIs and doctrine based on the, the critical task selection work we're doing to make sure we have those right skill sets and those general learning outcome and also the AMD learning outcome we need to make sure we can get to those threats. So. I, Dick, I think a couple of things that come to mind. One is speed, agility, uh, and uh, innovation, which I think are so critical. And I think a counter UAS and the threat that, again, Dr. Carver and what we saw the Russian threat doing in the Ukraine really caused us to have to take a hard look at where we were what we needed to accomplish and how we're going to go after this. Counter UAS in particular, when the Chinese saying, we're going to inundate the battlefield with 40,000 UAVs uh, in the future. And pro that was two years ago. Where they are today, I, I don't know. But obviously, it's even a greater threat than what it was then. One of the things that we had done, again, with the Striker program, is put directed energy and support with Rick Defada and the, the team helping us do some of that, Jim and your folks as well put directed energy on a striker, we took it out to Fort Sill. And the one thing that I think you have to do is you have to put soldiers on the equipment to be able to operate it, use it. You learn from that, you can flow that back into your doctrine, your tactics, techniques, and procedures as you learn, learn a lot on what this capability might be able to provide. So I think getting soldiers on the material solutions as quickly as possible is gonna have big payback for the Army going forward. I'll tell you, I've never been in a theater level exercise that didn't put that proverbial light coat of sweat on the brow doing the air and missile defense job. So I think, I think uh, you know, exercise design is critical. I, and I actually think we've done a pretty decent job of this uh, in, in the past, whether it's in, in AMDEX, uh, in CENTCOM, or in ADX, uh, CTX, UFG, uh, Key Resolve in, in Korea. But, uh, you know, that's key. At, at, the, at the operational level, you know, uh, you have uh, simulator devices and you, and you design your own exercises. And, and we've also been fortunate that in our, our certification requirements for our, our crews, whether it be Table 8 and, and above, is actually a pretty robust um, threat set that includes uh, things that we would expect to see from a near peer. So. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? If I may. Uh, yeah. There was a question that was asked a little bit ago. It was uh, really got to the ORL issue. They, we talked about radars and how far the missile system could engage. The radars can see much further than our, than our systems can engage, of course. So we've got to figure out how to get after that. And ORLs continue to get further away, and our missiles really are the same capability that we've had for some time. So uh, we struggle sometimes for integration between lower tier and, and upper tier. We've got to figure that piece out quickly and be, be past it. And then we've got to get after uh, the critical piece of integrating OCA and DCA operations. The, the two have to go hand in hand. They're absolutely one and the same in, in terms of being able to defeat a threat. So if the ORL is so far out, then it's an OCA responsibility, and then I've got to pick up the DCA piece of it uh, if there's any ordinance that's inbound. So we, we've got to figure out that piece pretty quickly. Um, and the other thing is we've got to just challenge our soldiers to figure out how to defeat the threat because most of the times we've got a problem and you ask Joe to come up with a solution, they generate it. Okay, thanks. 
I, I appreciate this next question because as the uh, Army's Director of Force Management, I get accused all the time of managing an onerous force management process. And I used to respond that I could change the process at the drop of a hat, but it still takes 15 years to grow a battalion commander, command sergeant major. And what really slows down the force structure process is the physics of raising leaders, building equipment, finding stationing. But that said, this question says, and it's really geared to the uh, regeneration of the maneuver shore ad capability, says, so we recruit privates and we commission lieutenants. How are we gonna find the seasoned NCOs, captains, field grades that we're gonna be required for the M shore ad force? I'm going to start with the schoolhouse, Sergeant Major. <laughs> That's a really good question right now. Great um, right now, talent management is what we're kind of keying off for right now. Because in the inventory, uh, most persons who want to stay in sure rad, they're mostly either the senior Sergeant Major or senior or colonel. So the ones really have the C rams, what kind of we've been doing for the last couple of years on, in the sure rad arena. Uh, like uh, multi-combo solution, you know, our National Guard brothers out there, out there they are doing – the Avenger operations, but for us, like 5488, what do we have internal to do it? So right now, we have 18 x-rays and 11 Bravos. We're going to do a class in April, 16 personnel, NCOs already, airborne qualified, understand maneuver. So we get them into the inventory. It's going to be a startup curve for them, but we'll start having to build that, that knowledge base and that experience we got to have based on the current resident, uh, inf um, resident institutional knowledge and the, um, the operational knowledge. But when you look at the AS and the SLC, we're going to also use those, those institutions of how do we get those coming back, those say E5 that's currently out there is 11 Bravo. Those personnel we got, see, we got 130 personnel training right now from 82nd Airborne, 2CR, and 173rd. So we're looking a lot, of those are reclassing right now. The 82nd Airborne Command has already asked us how can we get this personnel trained. So we'll leverage the RTI to get person, get them trained down the RTI for 14 Sierra, get them that, then send them to, bring them to the schoolhouse get them 14 papa train. Then we have an NCO that's already understand maneuver and they understand the basic of man pads. So it's gonna be a startup, it's gonna be a slow process, but that information, that knowledge base, that's why like organizations like Summit Wino has who does the CRAM training, those personnel who out there have a, uh, that are retiring, you know, we, we gonna leave that great beer experience to keep telling us how we fought it, how we, how we fought man pad, like I said about the red eye. Those are things that, it's just, it's not going to be some years before we get to where we need to be as a sure red force. And that's why, you know, like my battle says, you know, everybody, like we got a box of chiclets of sure reds on, on the side of him when people ask them things. It, it's, that has gone away. So to build that up, it's going to be a slow, painful growth pattern here. And that's why when Colonel Shank, like we looked at 5488, we have to be at 90 percentile. And the Colonel, we had a deep dive last week. What is the priority? Look at 244, they're going out the door right now down in Afghanistan with the C-Round mission. Then you have 55 who's going out next. And we've had a lot of our, it's, go back to our retention as well in our show red forces. We had, not, had nine decks uh, in the branch that didn't want to call based on, they said, so I'm major, I go to 244 deploy, I come back and go to Korea, and I come back and go to 55. When do I see my family? And that's where the personnel is the biggest issue I had. I've been fighting with my, my, battle, my, my General McIntyre's guidance. How do we get the personnel fixed? And that's where General Dickinson, he's been a great supporter on, of us. How, do we, how does the Army fix us? You know, we're looking at things, special duty pays. How do we get the bonuses? How do we do that non prior service personnel to get them on, on the, onto the books? Because our show ran for us. When we first, for CSA gave us the guidance to transition back to go to the, the, the show red, we were at 351 personnel in, of the whole 14 PAPA MOS for the Army. 351. We got to grow a battalion back for this year. A, a CSM, a SAR major, the battery commander, and so forth. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little bit of a growth pain on that, but it's going to take us in institutional, the dot D, and looking at how we get the right structure. And you know, like 3.8, 3.3-1.86, um, you know, all those guns we have out there, how do we, like Colonel Hollis said, make sure those are robust and make sure those in the operation, they maximize. And General Spielman has done a great job out there, him and Major Burley, to making sure 2455 retains knowledge. And there's a couple of COAs that uh, General McIntyre is looking at for the branch. How do we get 5-4 the resident knowledge in Germany? Because that's where 
the biggest threat right now. You know, everybody's a threat, but that's where we try and get the force at. And that's going to be two battalions in Germany that we're going to have stationed. So that goes into, you know, with, with the soldier. How do we keep a soldier in? You know, we have it, the Patriot. You know, with the enlisted, we have that challenge. And I know most of you out here, we have, like, our bonus. How do we compete with industry? You know, if someone come to that point, how do we retain them with our tempo we have? And many of us have, have been since the other storm. How do we tell us so this is going to be okay? But it's once again, it's like, how do we got to prioritize the priorities? What is the priority? How do we fill those organizations? But sure, it's, it's, it's good to be one, it's needed, but also that strain on how do we fill it? And that's what we have as the, as the, as the Okada and um, the Brent Sound Major Commander. We have to tackle those issues. Anybody else want to take that on? Because I'd also add, uh, I, I, there's a unit training component to this that Sergeant Major alluded to. Um, not only do you have to find the seasoned soldiers to man it, but then once you get it, how are we going to create capable units and, uh, and then keep them trained? So anybody else want to take that on? Yeah, Colonel Brady talked about a little bit uh, a little while ago about roving sands. I conducted the last roving sands when I was a battery commander in 2001. And th the lessons learned that you take away from those type of events just are, are it's impossible to match it. So the, the battalions have to participate in those types of events. The other piece is I, I think that we need to bring the war trace. Man was 11th Brigade commander. We used to do our QTB from the 2174th. And every single opportunity that I had to listen to Colonel Mann then talk was uh, a learning point for me to take away as a leader. And certainly I reflect on the, the conversations that we had during that interface then. Um, so there's got to be that higher headquarters link. And we've got some partnership programs that are out there with active components and things. But there's got to be that link of, of who's doing what and uh, to, to, to grow that back. And, and quite honestly, I think that the, uh, the National Guard's got a, a large piece in uh, getting the folks back. I don't think we had too many takers on the uh, captains going back into the active component. Uh, Bill Phillips, I'll put you on the spot as we, as the Army fields some of the systems that you referred to. Uh, any thoughts on the training implications of all that? Yeah, I think uh, that that's critically important because you think about bringing a new piece of equipment in or even upgrading one that might currently be in existence. Sometimes we overlook what's required to train the force up to be able to use that piece of equipment. And as I think back of what we did over 16 years of war, uh, there's, there's uh, good successes and then there's times where we, we didn't do so good. And I'll give you one example real quick. There was a need for a precision mortar to go in Afghanistan. And we developed it with ATK very quickly. Uh, but to be able to use that mortar in theater, uh, it became very difficult because the folks that were currently there had not been trained. And Dick, you remember the challenges we had in field artillery, going back to you, Mark McDonald, Halverson, and a host of others. The skill set was not there. We had not trained them enough to be able to use mortars, or for that case, Excalibur, effectively as a precision weapon that could put something in a bread box at 24 kilometers for Excalibur, obviously must let's for APMI. But we forgot about the training and what that would mean, Dick. And as we go forward, whatever systems or solutions are out there, it's absolutely critical that we do that. Just, just a quick, as a former OC, the CTCs are going to be a critical piece of this as well. Uh, getting the, uh, the air defense uh, teams rebuilt and the, the threat capability uh, replicated to, to get after uh, that problem set. And, and I think that'll bring its own challenge because now you got to have seasoned OCs that understand maneuver shore ad and how to apply that capability in support of a brigade combat team. Um, similarly, uh, Bill uh, Lamb, you mentioned uh, some of the training implications associated with IBCS. IBCS has come up throughout the course of today as it contributes or will contribute to increased capability and capacity. Any thoughts on the unique training implications of introducing IBCS into the force? Well, so I think one of the things that, um, that we were seeing with IBCS as we put soldiers on the system is it has a very intuitive interface. That's what we call the Common Machine Warfighter Interface, or CWMI. And, and really what we're, what we're learning from that is, and, and we've had uh, just a, a wealth of 
people like gamers, psychiatrists, soldiers, you name it, uh, looking at the development of that CWMI in terms of how is the smartest way to be able to present that information to uh, a, essentially a, uh, you know, the, the next set of 20, 20 year olds, 18, 20 year olds that have come up on, on gaming machines. What we found is, is that uh, it's very intuitive, very easy to pick up. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the challenges is, is that, that they are very uh, sort of weapon system focused. Uh, but that CWI and, and that whole training approach is really going to drive a reduced amount of training time that it will take to train IBCS soldiers. And when you train a soldier on IBCS, he's likely to, to carry that all the way through his career. So it's going to drive some implications, I think, for the branch uh, from a MOS uh, perspective, MOS training perspective. Because if, if I'm a soldier trained on IBCS, I'll be able to go, whatever unit I go to, I'm going to have a, I'll have a CWI interface that I am trained on. Uh, and it's just a matter of the roles and permissions that I'm able to, to log into. So I think that that'll be really substantive and really tough, I think, for the branch to try to take that on in terms of uh, how you implement that with the force. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Okay, Sergeant Major Dodson, this, this came in from the Redstone Huntsville chapter. We appreciate them being online. You mentioned this already, but I'll give you a chance to talk about it because you said this was your biggest uh, focus area, biggest challenge. Uh, but could you just elaborate again? How is the ADA school, what are they doing to open up MOS training for short range air defense? And what are the implications again for that as you balance the various training requirements that you'll have for particularly young enlisted soldiers? So great question, Ann. Um, so right now at the RTI, we only have one air defense RTI. That's down at Camp Blanding in Florida. So right now we're looking at ICTL for what's being trained for either the show rack, uh, we're making those a, um, a unit-based training. So those air defense, active duty as well as National Guard personnel can all be trained on one of the school system standard. They can go either way. So help alleviate the challenge we have of growing the air, growing those 14 pop and 14 golfs also go down there to RTI. So we have 14 golfs and 14 Sierra. So we're working also looking at making CRAM a functional course and making everybody a 14 apart. So there is no differentiation between a 14 apart, so there's no it's called old Sierra days. So we're looking that way to kind of make that easier. And also with the AMD, uh, I mean ADOS we have with the National Guard coming on active duty, we also try and get them to switch over to come to be um, active duty. And also vice versa, those who want to do ADOS, they can train on active duty based on the number of slots that are available to come on the schoolhouse or go out there into the, into the force to help us out. And SIFT has been a very critical in our ACRC slots at Camp Atterbury and down there in uh, Fort Stewart. So those have helped us out. But the junior soldiers in the training, um, you look at the show rat, it's, it's, it's going to be a challenge just it wants to just the expertise we're going to have in-house. It can be more doctrinal-based training. It won't be that experience based on how to get things done, you know, this is how you really do it. Now, when our National Guard, uh, you know, them come online, we'll have a greater training. Like, uh, I've been, I went to every CTC, and the one challenge we have, the JRTC, they have miles. Everybody know the miles we have, we are, we are out of, the miles we have right now in the inventory, it's all been put together like duct tape and, and, and bubble gum almost. <laughs> Uh, and it's only down, and we only have seven operational down there at, at our JRTC. NTC has none. They just got the Hein upgraded at NTC. We over in, in Germany, they're still trying to, Mr. Darnell is trying to build theirs up. So every matter where you go, like those soldiers, we got the Virgil Stinger done, we're using to get those show rack soldiers trained. So everything we have in the inventory, it's going to be a, a, a very steep curve for us training. But in the schoolhouse, um, with the number of cadre we have, we're, so we're competing with the operational force. Um, and, and that's where we're trying to look at the best of the best, how to retain them, and a lot of our, our personnel structures are, ca are contractors. And that's the only we're surviving right now, institutional force. A lot of personnel, some are retired air defenders, some of them never even seen air defense, but they're reading the, they get in the book and they teach it. So it's just not that institutional knowledge we need to have to keep a soldier um, that, that out there in the operational force. Um, and and kind of goes to one thing, poor as I didn't miss this point earlier. We look at our, our show red POIs. We're rewriting all those. So we're reaching back to the old 14 Mike for the most part. How do we get those soldiers? What is the base? Because everybody who understood that, that says it's gone. So we're trying to keep that internal. So 
hope that answered the question, and if that was going over my time, sir. No, you're perfect. You're good. Uh, Chief Young, you sir. talked about um, equipment upgrades, modernization, uh, and new equipment training. What, and given the demands on the force and the requirements for them to not only meet operational demands, but conduct unit training and exercises, what are the biggest challenges that you face in the ability to field new equipment to our units? Sir, some of our biggest challenges are, are exactly that. You have, you know, given the op tempo of units as they, as they rotate back in from a deployment uh, or as they're getting ready to train up and go and, and, and get back into the uh, training cycle to get back out ready to go to a deployment, we, we synchronize very carefully and, and, and normally our, 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 biggest, our biggest concerns and challenges happen within the, uh, within the 32nd WMDC footprint with our fourth comm units, uh, seeing as how they're the ones that are they're on that rotational pool so much. Uh, Korea was very successful when we were able to, to, to do a little borrow and, 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 and keep them in their we fight tonight uh, posture and, and things were very successful. Uh, but mainly, mainly CONUS, our challenges are you know, units are getting back. We try to we try to plug a modernization effort in during that time frame, but there ev everything else is more important or just as important. You know, uh, you know reintegration. Uh, then all of a sudden, you know, they've been gone for so long, and the other units getting trained to go up. Uh, so now they got guard duty, and and you know, so it's just it's the competing priority, and it comes down to comes down to leadership, and and, and our leaders on the ground. You know, battalion commanders, battery commanders. Uh, not necessarily putting the emphasis on that they should be putting on, but again, understanding that everything else is going on, it's, it's really hard to maintain that balance. So, so I, I think we do a really good job, and, and we do a lot of coordination moving into the, to the upgrade effort with whichever unit that we're, that we're focusing on. Uh, but it's just, it's just, you know, the op tempo, uh, like everything else, is, is just putting a strain on things. Thanks, Chief. Uh, this question, uh, Colonel Lamb, came in for you, um, but I'll open it to others as well. It really goes back to the implications of training for, uh, I think, IBCS, but it says the question is generally specialist versus generalist. And uh, with IAMD SOS requiring a breadth of knowledge, are we going to have the training time and capability to develop and grow leaders, or is there some other training strategy that we're going to need to apply? Oh, boy. Um, I'm not sure that I've got a real, real great answer to that because I think it's, it's very much contingent upon where we view the, the active duty force today and some of the, some of the areas that the Sergeant Major has, has talked about in terms of the challenges as we uh, look to try to train soldiers and try to fill what is now going to be a, a MSHORAD capability that gets fielded to the Army. I would tell you that that, uh, that IBCS has been developed uh, based on this is acquisition speak or engineering speak, but it's based on a modern open systems architecture. So it's it's been designed to be very flexible in terms of how it's uh, been developed, and that uh, that architecture will enable us to integrate new capabilities as they come along uh, at a much faster pace than what we have seen historically in in, uh, in weapon system development. And it really is a key it's a key function of and really, uh, the, the DOD and, and across the services are all driving toward a modern open systems approach in all, the, in all their acquisitions. But uh, that's a key, com a key component to modernization and being able to, to modernize on, I think, a, a, a more rapid pace. I think the, the building blocks are there for that. I hope that's responsive. That was good. Yeah, hey, go ahead, Sergeant Major. Hey, one thing on that, IBCS, we already look at the doctrine, but we're going to change all of OS to will change. It'd be a revolution in how we fight air defense. So what we know now will be different. We're going to have 14 kilos be our battle management operators, 14 Romeos be our radar operators, 14 Whiskeys will be our AMD integrators, 14 Lemons will be our launcher operators, and our 14 Apollo will be, of course, our Shorad. So it'd be a total revolution on how we think of MOS itself. Uh, this one I'm going to send to both industry reps. Um, in uh, Mr. L or Colonel Lamb's comments, he talked about embedded TADs. So the question really is, what is industry doing to build in training capabilities uh, versus standalone TAD simulators? I think the way I would respond to that is that we're just kind of on the, the, the leading edge of that. And uh, Colonel Rob Jassy, who's in the audience, he, he and I have had a conversation around, uh, I have a son-in-law who is an F-22 pilot who's just coming through F-22 training. And, you know, the F-22 is a single 
you, it's a single pilot, so when you fly that thing for the first time, you are flying it on your own. There's, there's nobody out there to help you. Uh, so they are very, very dependent on immersive simulations that, uh, that, that put that pilot in a totally immersive environment that totally replicates how that uh, F-22, how it, it, uh, how it flies, uh, you know, all, all the weapon systems and capabilities and sensors, all that stuff is fed to that, to that uh, officer uh, as a part of his training before he ever gets into, into an F-22. And I think from an IMD perspective, as we look at the development of TADS devices going forward, we need to look to see how we make that more immersive. We, we ought not to just stop at the interface between a, between a man and a computer. We ought to try to make it more immersive. Uh, operation realistic is always important, but obviously if you can create set the conditions where, no kidding, he feels like he is in an operations center, uh, he's got everything being fed into, uh, into his, his uh, head relative to comms and that sort of thing. Uh, the more immersive and the more realistic we can make it, I think the better at the back end as, as those soldiers come through training, the, the better off they'll be relative to, to being ready to fight. Uh, Dick, I would just add, I, I agree with everything that Bill said. Uh, it has to be a conscious effort up front to be able to incorporate TADS into the product that we're delivering. It can't be an afterthought. You've got to think through this very clearly. And my experience has been on the primarily on the aviation side. For the Apache system, when we build an Apache battalion, there's a longbow crew trainer that goes along with that. That's not just for the pilots, but for the crew to train and be prepared. And we, when we sent them down to Iraq and Afghanistan, we actually ended up sending some of the longbow crew trainers with them in combat so they could train not on the aircraft because those hours are so precious to be able to train on the system itself. And you got to think about the schoolhouse also. Uh, and sometimes that's a third or fourth thought. You got to be planning to upgrade the school systems also so the, the young men and women coming through there that are training on those systems have to be on the latest system that they're going to see in the actual units where they, they join them. And I think that's a challenge probably for this community going forward to make sure that we, we do some of those things. Okay, thanks. Uh, this has been a uh, great session, and I think we got the breadth of experience that this panel was intended to uh, deliver. I'm going to start with General Phillips at the end and give him 20 seconds each, come on down this way if you have a closing thought that you'd like to share with the audience. Yeah, I talked about uh, speed, agility, innovation, and I mentioned regs, rules, laws, procedures, and talking about not, not using them uh, as an excuse not to do something. When I think about my time working in acquisition and federal acquisition <coughs> regulations, you have great authority as a contracting officer, as a PM, as a decision maker, to be able to waive those things, and if you can't do it, the milestone decision authority above you likely has the authority to make those decisions. We should not hide behind them. Uh, and, and I could tell you one more quick story. 1907, uh, Captain Charles Wallace published in a number of trade publications a requirement for the heavier than air aircraft, page and a half. And all, the only ones who responded were the Wright brothers. And in about a year, they built the first Wright flyer. And it was a $25,000 project. He, they wanted to go 40 knots, have two, two pilots on board, and stay up for about an hour. They paid him $30,000 because it flew about 41 and a half knots, uh, stayed up a little bit longer. That is a firm fixed price incentive fee contract. <laughs> and so you look at the FAR today, there was no FAR back then. I mean, they did amazing things just doing, making smart decisions. We have to do that. And it is not true that Bill Phillips wrote that requirement. <laughs> Colonel Lamb. And, sir, I'll, I'll pass. Okay, thanks. Cur uh, Mark? See, I'm, I'm a history uh, buff, so you know, in, our, in our Army's history, uh, you know, we've seen uh, when we've had a requirement, and we've seen the le you know, leadership in the Army coming together with our industry partners able to solve some very tough challenges in a short period of time when there's the, the things we've talked about today, the resourcing and the requirement. And I think we have both, uh, and I look forward to uh, being part of the solution as we move forward uh, in solving uh, uh, the, the challenges we face ahead and improving our lethality and readiness. Thanks, Mark. Chief? Uh, sorry, I'd just like to uh, uh, thank everyone again for the opportunity to be here, but nothing further. Thank you. Sergeant Major. 
So thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel. And one thing on behalf of General McIntyre, if you in the Fort Sill in a community, I mean, a location on 18 June, we're going to have our 50 year anniversary for air defense at Fort Sill. So 18 June, 18 June, 18 June. I'd like to see y'all at Fort Sill for our 50 year anniversary. Thank you. Sorry, Major, anything happening on 18 June? Uh, so I think it's the uh, 50 year anniversary for AEA. All right, thanks. <laughs> Panel chair, Tom Moore. So the only thing I'd say is, in, in closing is that uh, just to beat the uh, maneuver shore rat horse a little bit more, the, there's a pretty steep training curve to, to bring that back online. And I think we, we've got to somehow figure out a way to make sure that the, man, the maneuver force themselves are bought into the air defense game. So we've got to get some type of air situational display in that commander's hands. So if we are relying on a, a do net only, he's got some skin in the game and understanding how we're employing across the force. That's going to support those liaison teams, those sar sergeant, section sergeants that are going out there conducting that air defense liaison function. If he's got a better understanding of what that air defense brings to the table. So I, I think we've got to work to get maneuver bought into the fact that, that they need the air defense again. Okay, thanks. Let me wrap this up with a couple of quick comments. One, uh, thanks to you, the audience, for your uh, attention and thoughtful questions. Thanks to the panel for their preparation and for their great remarks. I particularly appreciate Tom Moore, who in the middle of an operational mission uh, provided the leadership to chair this, so thanks to that. And then my closing thought is always, I valued the way that uh, General Dickinson closed his remarks today by focusing and highlighting on the soldiers and the way that General Hyten talked to the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and civilians at STRATCOM, because at these forums, we often talk about the, cap the technology that creates the missile and defense capabilities. And I always want to remind us that the most valuable space and missile defense capabilities that our nation has are the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines that develop it, deploy it, operate it, and uh, fight with it. So thanks to them and for all that they do for our Army. Let's give them a hand. Thanks. Thanks, Dick, very much. Good. Well done. Hey, we're going to take a break. Uh, we got 150 uh, outlying stations on the net now. So uh, those of you that are out there in streaming land, uh, continue to send us your, uh, your questions. Come on back in at 1500.